So who here knows LabVIEW? Who here bravely does not know LabVIEW? <laughs> okay, hush up on the front row. Who here has friends or coworkers that need to learn LabVIEW? Excellent. So I'm somewhat emceeing this, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna kick this off. Um, so I'm Nancy Henson. Uh, yeah, that's me. Um, it was probably, Steve, was it nine months ago or a year ago? I can't remember when it was when I found out what Steve and Derek were surreptitiously up to. And my immediate reaction was, this is a game changer, complete game changer. So I'm one of these old people that, is it politically correct to say old people? But if I'm calling myself an old person, I guess that's okay. I'm one of these old people that has been teaching LabVIEW for over three decades. And the very first time I taught LabVIEW was in 89, and it was a LabVIEW roadshow. And we would ship the boxes and the monitors. We would ship those from city to city. And then the rest of us, we hung out in Rob Watson's camper van as he drove us from city to city. And it would take us about three hours to set up for a class. It was a lot of work. It was a lot of fun. Um, one of my buddies, Mark Ridgely, teaches a lot of LabVIEW courses. I know Brian Powell teaches LabVIEW courses. It's still a little bit of work to set up for a course. And when I'm teaching the course, there's always something I want to add to it. Every single time I teach a course, it's like, well, I really think I would put this lesson before that lesson, and I'm going to go add this. And so the CTI completely changes everything. And so we're going to talk to you guys a little bit about the CTI, and we're going to talk a little bit about the fact, yeah, there's a lot of different ways to learn LabVIEW out there. I'm going to highlight a couple of them. Um, but when I saw this, it was a complete game changer. And so I'm excited to partner with these guys to leverage what they're building, um, help amplify what's amazing about it. Um, but first, let's uh, introduce... Um, professor Watts, the professor of pragmatism. Is, isn't that your name now? <laughs> That's the name you call me. <laughs> <laughs> so, Steve, you've been programming LabVIEW for what? You're like me, like 30 years or so, something crazy like that. Yeah, it's a long time. Yeah. You have a couple books out there, right? Oh, I'm sorry. I'll go, I'm hearing lots of echoes, so... Uh... You have, you've written a few books, large and small, about LabVIEW. Oh, yes. Yes, I've done that, yes. Yes. Built software engineering as well. Excellent. All that kind of stuff, yes. Fantastic. And Derek Bomarito, you do this crazy job. We were part of a team that, like, you guys launch rockets and, and stuff like that. Yep. Pretty impressive. Working on it. Working on it. And you've been at NI for a brief period of time. You've been at Halliburton. And um, you have done a tremendous amount of work um, on this project. I mean, you're, you're a rock star, period. And so um, very key uh, member within our community. It's great to have members in our community that are a little bit younger than Steve and I, which is really fun. So... That is my uh, quick introduction, and we're going to kind of go through. Steve's going to share with us about why uh, CTI, what is a CTI. I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, also a little bit about the why and kind of how it lines up with other ways to learn LabVIEW. Um, Derek's going to share a little bit about where we're headed with it, and we'll definitely, are we doing Q&A as we talk? Yeah. We'll yeah. do q Yeah, interrupt us if you have a question. We'll do Q&A as we go. Yeah, one of the main things here is you're all gonna drive this presentation. We've only got about 10 slides that we're gonna get through pretty quickly. Um, so by all means, ask questions, throw up ideas, anything like that. And I'm gonna introduce one other person in the audience um, in case you guys don't know the wonderful Miss Mallory Martin. Raise your hand. <laughs> Mallory drives strategy um, around uh, education services program at NI, and we've been we've been besties for quite some time. So um, I know Mallory will have some questions, and I want to make sure that you guys know that Mallory is here in the audience as well. Okay, well, I've got to talk about the why now, haven't I? So. Um, 
What we were trying, the problem we were trying to solve is that there's a cost barrier to starting trading with LabVIEW. So if I want to give a, a, a hands-on course for a room full of people, there's a cost barrier to that. Um, and NI has given us the gift of the LabVIEW Community Edition. So there is, we can, we can have that for free. So people can have that for free. Um, but how could we let a, a room full of students have access to LabVIEW, an industry standard hardware for, for little or no cost? This is, this is where we were, were initially coming from. This is expanded, really, as we went into it a bit more. Um, the other barriers include sort of installation complexity, um, access to training materials, just, just a starting point. And again, it's, it, these are the problems we, we, we set out to solve with the CTI. Um, so the heart of it is the low cost or no cost hardware. Um, and this is a lot of, the, well, all of this is thanks to Derek. Uh, he's written a standard Visa Scopy overlay that, that sits on top of a Raspberry Pi Pico, a 2040. These are $5 microcontrollers. Um, and when you talk to it as if you were talking to a 40,000 pound oscilloscope. So you're teaching people right away with industry standard tools. Uh, the other advantage of Visa is that you can easily write an emulator because all you need is to, to talk, listen to it on a uh, Ethernet in Visa language and respond to an IDN. Thanks, Brian, for telling me all this. Um, so that's the no cost option is you have an emulator. The other advantage of things like Picos is the hobby space gives us inexpensive breadboards and experimental boards. Um, so we can build out sort of tools and things like that, which I, I will show you um, in a bit. Uh, the next one is installation complexity. Um, so the simplest install is what we're, we're aiming for here is just to watch a progress bar uh, progress. You know, click on something, watch a progress bar, and then at the end of the progress bar, everything works. Uh, it's kind of nice to have a training sandbox, so I quite like virtual machines. So we've built a virtual machine image that comes into VirtualBox VMware KVM. Uh, it's an open VM thing. It's fantastic, really. Um, and it just, you can download it from Gcentral and just install it into VirtualBox, and away you go. Um, I say just, it's gigabytes, so it's you, there'll be quite long watches of progress bars, but uh, we've got it down to about four gig now, um, so it's pretty fast. Um, the next thing we're, I'll, 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 I'll just describe quickly, but Steve, we can look Steve, at I'm going to ask you a quick question for clarification. You said you've gotten down the installer for everything is down to, you said four gig. You're pretty small. I beg your pardon. Oh, you can't hear me. Um, what size did you get the installer yeah. down to? Uh, the machine um, image. So we've got a uh, open SUSE one, which is the standard one you'll get now from G central. That's about eight gig. I think, I mean, it's maybe a bit less than that. Um, the Lubuntu one is about 4.3 gig, maybe 5.3 gig, it's much smaller. Um, we're probably going to end up with X Ubuntu. Um, so that's the other thing is that this virtual machine is Linux. Um, it's going to have sort of LibreOffice. It's going to have LabVIEW, Community Edition loaded, and all the Visa drivers loaded. So everything's loaded. So all you have to do is license LabVIEW. Uh, if I could get away with it, it would come with the license as well already, so you could just run it, but hey-ho. Um, but that, that's pretty much that whole virtual machine uh, process, which the reason we went for sort of things like Linux is, is we can take ownership of the deliverable. Um, if it's Windows and things like that, yeah, you're always messing around with with licenses and stuff like that. So this is this is something that we we were cognizant on. Um, the bit we're working on now, which we're very excited about, is that we found some hardware that we can sit this on, and it's uh, rather nice. It comes with a Pico on board and it's a motherboard and it's very cheap. And I'll show you, I'll, we'll talk about this in a bit. And, uh, I think um, Derek's gonna talk about this in a bit. This is even nicer then, cause you can have the actual hardware to play with and take away as a, as a student thing. Um, so I think this is a, a massive 
a step forward as well. So you've got options. Um, the, the other part of it is access to training materials. Uh, we've made everything we can open source. It's all on GitHub. Uh, it's, um, so if you look on my, my screen here, essentially you get the course materials, instructions, the emulator, the drivers, uh, the firmware for the Pico, everything's included. Um, if you want to go and do C and write firmware, even that's included in the, the GitHub page. So you can do stuff like that, you know, and we've, we've got ambitions to use different microcontrollers where they're more common and, and things like this. So um, that's one of the things with open source is you can actually start stuff uh, and starting is, uh, you know, and allows people to sort of carry on. So this is probably a hands-on course. I don't know how long it takes to go through, but um, there's a few few lessons um, so, uh, and quite a lot of examples. And, you know, it's, it's enough to be getting along with. Um, so that's already been forked off into Spanish. Uh, I think it's going to be forked off into French soon. Um, so members of the community are doing this. Um, so that's good. And we really, really want it forked off. Um, it's under an MIT license. Um, so that's cool. So use it as you like, modify it as you like. If you want to give it to the community, cool. If you don't, cool. Um, and that started another round of sort of things that were a bit different about this and things that actually I think we can, we can push. And this is the open sourcing of training materials. Um, now, if, if you have a training course that's residing in your training course filing cabinet and it's got a bit out of date and a bit dusty, you know, maybe like it's Madview 2014, for example, just picking a number out of, my, out of the air, uh, and you're not updating it, well, why don't you open source it so that others can? <laughs> you know, just saying. <laughs> so <laughs> nothing specific, but I, I think there's, there's very little value and the IP has no value if nobody's using it and nobody wants to take the course because it's so old. So you might as well open source a lot of this stuff. And so we're trying to, to push that now as, as a thing that people think about is, um, you know, Making, making access to training materials uh, all over the place. Uh, so that's the other thing is we want different languages. Uh, we want different courses. The hardware is currently aimed at sort of DAC type uh, stuff. It's, we, we, uh, we've got an overlay, we've got a hardware abstraction layer above the microcontroller because the microcontroller is reasonably complicated. Um, so that means you could then write another hardware abstraction layer above the microcontroller and make it do other things. So, and, and uh, Derek will talk about that uh, and, and his plans. Um, so that's that's the why. I'll let everyone else talk about everything else unless there's any questions. So yeah, Steve went through all the goals pretty much already. Um, and the biggest thing we're looking to do is encourage the community to grow um, this training, uh, translate it, provide new lessons, suggest updates and capabilities we can add to the hardware so new lessons can be made, um, all the fun stuff like that. Uh, so how can you get involved? Uh, a couple things quick, nice big QR code if you uh, are a Discord user. Uh, Discord is where we discuss all of the plans. Uh, if there's feature requests for the firmware and the hardware capabilities, if you wanna get involved with the development or translations, anything like that, this will be the home for where to do that. Get those cameras ready again. If you're interested in contributing directly to the material, uh, helping with, if you uh, do some C, C++ development, uh, I would love to not be the only person working on the firmware code. Um, but everything is available uh, from Git, GitHub. Uh, and um, yeah, so we'll also talk about uh, what you'll find there in a little bit more detail and what's gonna be coming in the future. Uh, so who here has used a Raspberry Pi? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, interject a little bit. My slides never showed up here. I exported it just before. 
Oh, o'clock. Okay. <laughs> or 11 o'clock. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, um, my slides didn't make it up here. Um, and I'm one of these people that's somewhat dependent on Microsoft and when I'm in Google and other tools, I'm not quite as good. Um, because we want to dive into some of the details of the hardware because there's some amazing things going on there. But I wanted to real quickly um, ask the question, why something new? Because we have fantastic ways to learn LabVIEW. First of all, um, I mentioned NI training. So NI training is absolutely fantastic. And if you get a chance and you can afford it and everything else, go sit for an NI course, especially if you're at a company that has an EA and you got your training credits, go sit for a course. Five days, that's great. How many people actually have three to five days to give out of uh, their, <laughs> their year to go learn it? And when you leave the course, do you get to take your hardware home? No, you don't get to take your hardware home. Um, there's two other very, very, very good um, training courses. And when I drop a video this afternoon on the CTI, I will link them as well. Um, and there's many great training courses. Like there's George who has this great training course in the UK. We've got um, Tom McQuillan uh, who has uh, Tom's LabVIEW Adventure. Uh, Piotr, uh, Piotr Ma who is um, from Poland has done a fantastic uh, training course. And you can find all this stuff is free on YouTube. But what's unique here is that it's open source and we get to customize it. So I have my friend Joe and Joe's a real person and Joe lives in um, Melbourne, Florida. Joe, uh, Joe works for uh, an aerospace defense company. Joe does not have any time because Joe is constantly running around from person to person to person and teaching them what Joe knows. But what we can do now is we can take this content and we can create five or six examples that are designed exactly around the um, architecture and the style that Joe programs in and that Joe is using and somebody has the hardware. And so this is a fantastic opportunity for us to work with Joe and help customize the learning um, for his particular customers. Absolutely fantastic. The other thing I like about this learning and a few other um, uh, ways of learning LabVIEW. Can you flip back to, there was a slide that had some code in it. Um, <clears throat> no. Okay, well, there, oh, you had some code up at some point. Yeah, I'll be doubling. Uh, yeah, well, so when I was going through um, the, uh, Steve's example, and I'm gonna have, like I said, I'm gonna have a couple videos on um, that will complement this. It's like, it's just practical. You're not learning anything you don't need to learn when you're getting started. And the drivers are fantastic because it's just basic visa calls. It's just like talking to any other piece of hardware. And so when I take this and I go teach someone LabVIEW um, using this content, I can tell them, you are using the exact same stack that the guys at SpaceX are using to launch rockets. And we all know that SpaceX uses LabVIEW because it's publicly known. We all know Blue Origin uses LabVIEW for launching rockets because it's publicly known. And most of the spaceflight companies are using LabVIEW. So it's the exact same stack. And so that's what I'm really excited about. And I'm going, I have one more thing I'm excited about, but I'm going to turn it back over to Derek. Okay. Where was I? Okay. So question, who here has used a Raspberry Pi, the single board computer? Has anybody started using the Pi Picos yet? How many people have used an Arduino? Oh, a whole bunch, okay. Uh, so everybody here played with the hobbyist toolkit, used to be known as Lynx. Okay, so this is kind of along the lines of the hobbyist toolkit, but now for a Pi Pico instead of Arduino. Um, so if you're unfamiliar with the Pi Pico, it is an awesome little uh, board. Uh, I'll be showing one off in a little bit. Um, you know, about yay big. Uh, it's got a bunch of connectivity like uh, serial communications, I squared C, uh, SPI, whole bunch of digital IO, a couple of analog inputs. Uh, and the awesome, the really awesome stuff that we're not leveraging yet, we're still working on that code, um, is it has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Uh, so initially, we're hooking up to it with USB, talking to it directly over a virtual COM port. Um, but you could leave this somewhere once you configure it on Wi-Fi and still talk to it. So it's kind of tethered. Derek, I have a question for you. Yeah. So how easy is it for me to get started? Like, 
I live in the Windows world and I don't use Linux and I've already gone through the absolutely painful process of downloading LabVIEW and deciding what needs to be included. Did I get a giggle out there in the audience? <laughs> All right. And then I have my Pico board or my Raspberry Pi with my Pico board. How much work is it for me to take what you guys have done and start communicating to my Raspberry Pi with the Pico board? Uh, so it's pretty easy. Let me uh, figure out which... Oh, what did I do? Where did OBS go? There's, 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 there's nothing specifically Linuxy about any of this. It's just I use that because I'm a cheapskate and I don't want to pay Microsoft any licenses. Yeah, because um, because as I recall, Steve, all I had to do is literally drop the firmware onto the Pico board as it was connected to my laptop. And then you, and then in the manual, and, and this is part of what's really important and valuable, and I didn't bring my print out, but you've got the manual, and the manual says, connect the red wire from here to here and the blue wire from here to here. It is stupid simple. Like, there's nothing that can go wrong. So setting it up, there were no problems, and it was super easy. Yeah, so the technique, in, in Windows, this would be exactly the same. You, you plug in your um, Pico uh, with the boot select button in, uh, you then remove it. It comes up as a little hard drive, um, which you then drag this over. As soon as it sees it's got a UF2 file in it, it goes, oh, now I'm a thing with firmware. Steve, can you back up uh, a minute? I wasn't showing your screen. Oh, I saw a big screen there. Sorry. That was away. The universe was speaking to us a moment ago. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely picture I got in New Mexico. Uh Tell me when. Yep, you're good to go. Ah, right, sorry. Okay, so this is Linux, but it'll be exactly the same in, uh, in, in Windows, is, is you download the, um, from our um, GitHub, you download the getting started zip, you extract it, in there is a firmware, the firmware is a UF2, you plug your Pico in with the boot select button in, you remove your finger from the boot select button and it comes up as a little hard drive. You drop this file, drag and drop it over. And uh, as soon as it sees it, it says, oh, I've got some firmware. And then it turns into a microcontroller with firmware. Um, and that's it. Um, so as we're building out things in the courses in the GitHub, this, this uh, version number will increase. Um, so um, that will that will be good. So Steve, uh, while you're there, good things can, coming. I say while you're there, can you pop up um, the manual? So go back to uh, uh, Steve. Uh, I don't, probably couldn't hear. Her. She asked uh, if you could pop up the guide manual, the the course yeah. manual. Let's have a look. Boop, 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 boop. Uh, so there's an instruction manual there the actual course manual. Now I like open office. Everyone else in the, in the group seems to want to put it into the, uh, uh, the documents. But Markdown. There's, there's, a, there's a manual. Markdown language, that's the one. But anyway, here's, here's the setting up the system. It just tells you how to go for it all. How to do the emulator? There's a there's an executable emulator. Um, you can build that, and then it goes through the courses and building it out, um, and how to wire things for each course, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And if I downloaded the Spanish one, you could have had that in Spanish. Hurrah! Um, so there's tutor instructions and it's tools Steve. as well. So there's templates and things. Why, why is yeah. everything in Linux and why isn't this updated for Windows yet? Um, because I haven't done it. I want this for Linux because I want Linux. Linux, to my mind, is more universal. Uh, somebody in, a, in India or in Vietnam or wherever can have access to Linux. And, uh, and the Windows snarky comment accessible. that I was trying to get from you, Steve, is, Nancy, you said you were going to update all the instructions to also include all the instructions I'm, for Windows. I'm too much, of a, too much of a gentleman yet, for that. 
But, and I think what that, that, that gets to the point where there, there's this base set of material that is very well written, very practical, but I'm going to be teaching it in Windows. And so what I'm going to do is I need to go update all the material so that there's an installation, there's already the installation instructions for Linux, and then I'm going to add the section, the installation instructions for Windows. And for those of you that aren't super familiar with licensing, this is under... Uh, Steve mentioned this is under the MIT license. So it's like an open license and we can use it however we see fit. The ask from the community is that when Tim, you're putting together, or Brian, you and Brian are putting together some special training for one of your customers, we just ask that as long as it's not, um, as long as there's no uh, IP related, just push it back so that we can all benefit from the additions that you guys are making. And so that's how something like this can grow over time. For instance, there's not a section here on using classes. So I'm gonna put a section in there on using classes so that we can all collectively build off of this basic branch, continue to add lessons, and then we may fork and do something special for a certain use case. Oh, this projector is making a mess out of your code. Or no, that, no, this is, is a Linux, Linux thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is a rendering thing. I haven't got to the bottom of it yet. So this is actually areas we need uh, probably help and input and time. Um, um, view Van Gogh edition. I'll tell you what, uh, there, we can't see that. There, that's nice. <laughs> um, but you can see this is standard scuppy. Um, and it's just, that's, that's all it's doing. Um, I'm hoping X Ubuntu is going to solve this. L Ubuntu does not. Uh, and OpenSUSE obviously suffers from it. It's just four loops for some reason. It's very odd. It's very annoying. You can see that. While loops, fine. Um, so yeah, we just built, we built out examples and samples and things like that. And it's all, it's all fairly standard. Um, are we are we ready to talk about the next stage or oh no talk about the next the the, the coming improvements to the um, yeah the Pico okay. stuff yeah Derek was headed there and I just interrupted the few questions for clarification skip past that talked about that so yeah so some of the future work we've got planned and then we'll hop into demos um, planning on using the Wi-Fi chip that's on the Pi Pico W uh, which will let you stash it somewhere and still pull data from it and still control it. Uh, looking to expand to additional targets, want to pull in Arduino uh, initially, and at some point, maybe, maybe if people are interested, uh, we can work on pulling in the ESP32, which is another really small, really cheap, affordable uh, platform that's become really popular as well. Uh, we want additional modes for the firmware and the LabVIEW wrappers, so a more DACMX style API where you're configuring multiple channels for input and output, configuring the timing, um, and you'll be able to learn DACMX style programming and data acquisition with this platform. Uh, we're gonna expand and update the emulator capabilities. Uh, and we're talking to NI to see if it's possible to get better integration with the getting started window. Um, it's got a couple of configurable items, but um, for giving a consistent starting experience um, to people trying to use this platform and especially use it for training, um, we wanna streamline that uh, if possible, uh, we're gonna set up some software. It's already been started for managing your devices. Uh, it's already pretty easy to use a Pi Pico, uh, but when we start using the Wi-Fi availability, you'll have to configure the, the access point configuration and all of that. Um, and just keep trying to engage everybody for contributing back to this. Uh, any questions before we start showing off some demos? Okay. Casey. Oh. I'm just curious, what is the state of the lessons currently? Um, did a so good the, job explaining the hardware and the, the, the software setup. I was just curious about the lessons. The question, Steve, is what is the state of the, the lesson at the moment? It's currently designed as a hands-on. So you're probably looking at four hours. I've not actually sat down and gone through it all, but you look at it at four hours. I'll tell you what, let's just show you the course. I should um, probably have prepared and had a copy of it downloaded myself. <laughs> so I'll yeah. um, answer that a little bit. I think there's about seven or eight lessons. And, um, so how I, many pages is it? It's quite a few pages. So it's about 50 pages long. Uh, you can see it goes 
I like there we go. things to do with hardware. So I, I like, you know, the first lesson is turn the LED on and off and all that kind of stuff. So we're going through it like that. Um, so the lesson materials is essentially shows you how to wire it up. Then it goes through the version of um, Hello World. Um, and then I kind of like the put something down, show an error way of doing it. So um, we I, I, we hit that quite early, sort of saying, look, that's all broke. How do we stop it being broke? Yeah, um, I'm going to elaborate. Um, let Steve know, Derek, that I'm going to elaborate. Like the very first lesson, you run it and you get an error. And then you, and then you go back and understand, oh, here's why I got the error. And so um, I think a few of us, maybe Sam Taggart uh, and I are going to go, are trying to plan, let's go do the old-fashioned LabVIEW hands-on road shows that we did back in the day. Go hit five or six cities back to back to back and just bring back the hands-on using this as content. Um, yeah, so yeah. I, I, that, oh, that, that, oh, that oh, was my... Hold on a second, Steve. I've got a question. Oh. oh. Running a microphone okay. back to him. What does the timeline look like for some of those future projects, specifically like Arduino and the ESP32s? Uh, so Arduino is probably about a month out. ESP32, uh, no deadline, because I do have some to test with, but uh, it depends on who, you know, what features get asked for, who's interested in what platforms. Um, so if they're interested in those, join the Discord, poke us. Um, and then some of the other items, uh, so like the DACMX style API, that's gonna be a couple of months, uh, probably towards the end of the summer. Uh, if I had to guess, it'll probably likely be in the fall. Um, but if we get more people to help out, uh, it'll be more than just like two people working on it and that'll be fit. Yeah, that's we do the have end. more people in the Discord helping out with the courses and the translations and stuff like that. But right now I'm the solo developer. Yeah, that's, firmware, that's the answer so. to a lot of this is it's open source and it's based on Derek being very, uh, altruistic at this point. And so, you know, if we can make this more of a community effort, we can get some of that stuff done sooner, especially if you're using it for your company, maybe you can incentivize by, you know, paying some employees to put some time in maybe, I don't know. Yeah, all, all the contribution back will help us move a little bit faster. Um, yeah. Anything else you wanted to I'm show off, Steve? Uh, should, we go, should we do the demo of the rats, sir? Yeah. Do you have yours set cool. up or you want me to show mine? Yeah, I can I can show mine if you would give me the screen. Um if I can find my camera, where's that? So the little board that we see here is called a, a Radster, Radster I D X A. Uh two, no, X two L. I'll show you it. And it's a nice little board of which let me show you some details in case you wanted to buy one. Now, that is about $56 in freedom currency. Um, so the one, I, the one I've got on it is this one I splashed out, I thought I'd go crazy, that's $71. And that gives you this little board. Now, this little board has a Pico on it. That there is a Pico header. Well, it's a Pi header. They've tried to make it a Pi header. But that little chip there, if you can see my little uh, thingy there, is a Raspberry Pi Pico 2040. You've got two USB 3s, two USB 2s, HDMI, Ethernet 1, Gigabyte. Uh, yeah, and there's the RAM, and there's a real-time clock. And it's a nice little board. A uh, nice little board it is. It's sat. I've had it running all day, which is my day has been longer than your day. Um, and let's have a look. Yeah, so the nice thing is, is this is a little x86 64-bit um, quad-core computer that has basically a Raspberry Pi Pico built into it. So all of our software stack you can load on the included Pico, and now you've got a single board computer uh, that all this stuff runs on. You can run, you can hook a display up to it just like a Raspberry Pi, run LabVIEW, 
Um, and it's Intel, so we don't have to worry about software not being compatible for ARM. So let me make sure. So this has been running all day. We've got LabVIEW going. It's, so it's a little old four core Celeron. So think of it as a 10 year old laptop, probably. Um, and it's fine. It's working really fine. It's just sat at 40 degrees. It's, it's ticking over, you know? Um, so here I've got my, my demo. So it's just here. Um, so it uses the analog out. It's got a pulse width modulation and analog out. So you just tell it it's frequency and duty cycle. So I run that. And now I can go beep, beep, beep. Hopefully you'll make, you'll hear some sound if I put my. Very tuneful. I, do, I presume you heard some tunes. Um, I want to stick to any development, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, very pleased. It's a nice little beast. Um, you can turn uh, LED, LEDs on and off. So if I if I go into the solutions part of this um, and load, load the hello world, well, actually no, let's do the. Do, 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 do. Oh, yeah, I'll do that in a word. Oh, one thing Linux doesn't like is double clicking on the. Da, da, da. Let's do that one. It's got everything on it. As you can see, I'm a, I'm a thorough Linux expert here. So here, this thing's doing all things. So if I, if I turn on that, oh, I'll tell you what, let's shrink him down. Um, the other thing is it's, I'm remoting in using no machine, which is rather nice. Um, so the poor little CPU load is, is struggling more than it would do if you were just running it to let direct. Um, so you can see I've turned an LED on, I'll turn it off now. Think, turn it on. Think, it's a little bit laggy, but it's doing things. I'll turn a beeper on, be annoying. Beeper, um, twiddle pop. <laughs> Pop twiddled, press a button, oh, big hand, see the little button there. So it's kind of useful. I mean, just generally as a board, it's kind of useful. I mean, you could use this as an embedded system and it could monitor its own power supply, for example, and set an alarm completely independently. So it's, it's, a, it's a cool thing. Uh, and it's just sat. It's cruising, you know, look at the temperature here. It's, so this is, if I go sensors, it's just, it's 50 degrees, it's, pfft, this is, that's the CPU core, the little, oh, it's got, a, oh, that's the other thing. Underneath it, it's got an MVM uh, solid state drive. So you plug that in and away you go. Um, so yeah, nice little beast. Now, what we want to do is just create an image, and I've done this. You just create an image. So where we've got a virtual machine where you just install it, buy one of these, install the image. And when you wake it up, it's just got LabVIEW unlicensed, sat there and all the drivers ready to go. Um, so that's the next, again, this is the next phase is, is to just be able to bung an image onto a piece of known hardware like this. Uh, and uh, uh, then, you've got, then you've got pretty much I don't know, for, well, certainly for less than $100, uh, a system which you can go away and, and teach people on. And, you know, if you're, if you're charging for a course, because I'm not a commie, then you can, uh, <laughs> you can um, you know, make it part of the course cost. It's, it's even that kind of thing you could do if you were putting on a course. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's a fairly small price for the overall um and if you were collecting course materials for yourself it's again it's it's kind of affordable um yeah you're not gonna you know it's, these aren't supercomputers, but they're adequate they're adequate for teaching and that's cool i think they're very good so uh, that's the rad stuff i'm gonna steal the uh, stage from you steve i'm gonna show off Do some it. other local demos um so i've got one of these running here uh, how's that? Not bad. Uh, and I'm going to set up some screen capture so we can see me working on code. Um, so 
This little chip that's down here is a little GPS module from Adafruit. Uh, it connects over a serial port. Uh, we're inside, not gonna get a GPS lock in here, um, but I am using the PyPico uh, and the software stack to uh, read from the GPS. So this stuff isn't just useful for the training. Um, part of the idea is to get something like the Hobbyist Toolkit updated with newer devices. Um, they haven't really had any new um, boards that they've supported, new microcontrollers that they supported. Uh, so this is usable, usable for a lot more um, so, than just the training. So Derek, I got a question um, yep. I'm assuming somebody might have is, um, what is the Hobbyist Toolkit? Uh, so the Hobbyist Toolkit is something that was, a, I forget the original company that started it. Does anybody know? Digital? Digi it's Digilin, yeah. So I think it was Digilin um, had started the Lynx Toolkit um, way back when, I think it was uh, originally available in 2014. Um, but when uh, NI released LabVIEW Community, they took that in-house and distribute that with LabVIEW Community. So when you install LabVIEW Community, right out of the box, you get a palette of functionality for interacting with Arduinos, uh, a couple of other microcontrollers that I forget what they are. Um, you can actually build and deploy LabVIEW applications to Raspberry Pis and BeagleBone Blacks. Um, so it's, it's kind of the, the first foray for getting into the hobbyist uh, space with LabVIEW, um, and we're just looking to expand on that. Um, so yeah, pretty simple setup here. This is showing off the, uh, the driver wrapper layer. Uh, as Steve showed, it's all doing Visa under the hood building Skippy command strings, so learning standard ways of talking to instruments and devices. Uh, and this is just reading in from the serial port on the PyPico. We're configuring for serial port one uh, on the device, it's got two. Uh, and I'm configuring, I've got a little bit of GPS parsing code that I've just thrown in here. Uh, we can see the time updating, and of course it can see no satellites in here. Uh, so it's <laughs> not the most interesting one. Uh, if we run a couple of other demos, uh, where's the, uh-oh, demo's failing. Turn it off and back on again. Can't trust it unless the demo fails once. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this demo is not, I probably did not update the commands on that one. Uh, let me try. So while, while Derek's this doing that, and Derek, while you're getting, oh, you got it. Okay, there we go. Um, so it can do pretty decent uh, sample rates. This is just reading an analog input. I'm supposed to have a microphone hooked up to it, but the microphone does not seem to be responding. Uh, and then uh, to give a quick preview of a presentation I'm doing tomorrow with Darren Nattinger, uh, one of the things we're doing for Summer of LabVIEW uh, is one of the challenges will be implementing steering logic for a race car. Uh, so right now there's just very simple code uh, not the instructions, that's not what I wanted. So there's some very simple code. It's just which side am I closest to steer away from it basically is what's happening. Um, but I'm gonna update this real quick to uh, use the PyPico setup using the driver stack from CTI. And I'm gonna hope I remembered which ADCs they were. So you can see here, this is the functionality we have available. I'm not covering that in my, um, we've got analog inputs, uh, digital input and output. You can set the pull-ups, pull-downs, uh, PWM. So this is what Steve was using to generate the tones out of the speaker. Beautiful can, music, I think you mean. Beautiful, beautiful, Steve. Uh, operate the, the onboard LED and do uh, reading and writing from the serial. Again, all the, the other functionality will be uh, on its way. 
So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try and set this up so I can steer the car and I'm probably gonna have to fix which uh, analog channel that is. Should have just had this in a disable structure. <laughs> So Q, I've got a question for you while um, Derek is finishing this out. So at Test Track, you guys have a pretty extensive software stack. Um, and the, the Test Track framework is now affectionately known as uh, Test Point, right? Did I get that right? right? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. So when you guys bring people in, what are some of the things that you guys are doing today for training new engineers in the style that they need to be able to uh, develop things in the test track way? And is there something here that could potentially be beneficial because somebody can have their, their hardware at home and, and be building some things and learning how to do things in the test track way? Do you see well, potential here? I'm gonna actually defer to Alex here who is our training architect and let him answer the question for you. <laughs> I, I prefer the term architect in training, but um, <laughs> we, this has actually been a huge pain point uh, throughout of all, uh, through training. Um, wh when we teach interfacing to hardware, we typically have to do simulation and that's a huge mental breakdown. Uh, people start thinking software minded things like, hey, I needed to keep track of the voltage I've set on this DC power supply. No, you don't. You've set the voltage, the instrument knows what it is, right? And so something like this is gonna be extremely useful uh, as far as training and connecting um, what we need to keep track of in software and, and how, do, how do we write software that specifically interfaces with hardware. That's great to hear. I like hearing that because we've had some conversations in the past over, okay, well, just send somebody to a course, but here you guys have a very, very defined way of adding components into your software and as a perfect use case of we want to train someone to do things in the test rack way and this will definitely help with that it sounds like. Yeah, we definitely have a guided development process to help engineers quickly develop and, and, and maintain a test system. So adding something like this will show a, a lot of the benefits um, of, of the way that we do things. So I'm, I'm very excited about this actually. Great, that's great to hear. Yeah. Wow. I was actually whispering to him as Steve was playing the piano. I was like, how cool is that? You could have a simulated one an instrument there where you're just pressing buttons and then you can, you know, through our framework, you could switch it from the simulated to the actual instrument very quickly and then start pressing physical buttons and having it do the same thing. So oh, that's fantastic. I have hooked something up wrong here and I keep shorting out the chip. Yes, question. You got that. Yeah, very nice. I have a very generic question, which might be good to kind of ask right while we're waiting for a little bit. Um, I opened LabVIEW for the first time last week. And so I'm in a spot where I currently developed a Veristan application to pull data Ooh. off a temperature module. The question that I have is, how much lab view do I need to know? Or can I start to learn various data? Can I start to learn test data? Can I use those first? And kind of, or do I need to go back and understand the lab view underlying everything? So that's a great question. And I'm going to answer the question in the same way that my dear friend Brian Powell would answer all of my crazy questions. And it would be, it depends. Um, and happy to, to talk offline. I, I honestly think having a good 
understanding of what LabVIEW is, how it works, build a few examples, write some code, so at least you understand this is what I can do in LabVIEW, so that when you get into Veristand and there's something that's like, wait a minute, I need to do X, Y, Z, you at least know what what you can do in LabVIEW and what your skill set is. So I would just encourage you to grow your LabVIEW skills as you grow your skills on all the tool chains that kind of are part of the, the LabVIEW Plus ecosystem. And the reality is um, LabVIEW is the only programming language on the planet designed by engineers for engineers, scientists, technicians to interface to hardware. There is no other tool out there. And it's always been designed with the intention of communicating with hardware. And so it's great when I can go do a bunch of stuff in test stand, which I encourage people, don't reinvent test stand with LabVIEW, don't reinvent Veristand with LabVIEW, but the fact that I can go in there and talk to hardware in a tool chain that was developed by engineers for talking to hardware is just immensely valuable to have that in your back pocket. We can talk offline with your detailed questions, and then I'll be more precise than it depends. <laughs> Could I do one more demo? Absolutely. Please save me. Show my, <laughs> show my screen. <laughs> so I, I think I heard somebody saying, uh, with, with, the, with the no cost option. So here is the emulator that we were talking about. And here's just the pre piano program I, I was playing. So if I press that, you can see it's now doing duty cycle stuff on the. Um, so if I if I move that up, you'll see the duty cycle go up. Yeah, there you go. If you zoomed in, you probably would. But anyway, so yeah, it's 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 reasonably amusing. Um, and you can see here it's TCP/IP. Do, 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 do. So it's going on over the local um, Ethernet. So it just picks it up. So you copy that. that gives you whatever the, the host IP address is. So you just copy that, bug it into there, and that's your visa address sorted. Um, so yeah, so that's what we meant by the sort of emulation side of it is, is I would like for people to do something similar if they're building their own courses because I like the idea of a no cost. Now, I'm not going to tell anyone to do anything. Um, it's just, a you know, I, I think if we set out the kind of things we'd like and, and lead by example, then, then hopefully... The, 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 it will carry on in the same way. Now, will this get used a lot? I don't know. Um, who knows? Um, but it was it was fun to write. I was teaching my daughter how to program, so <laughs> it was all good. Uh, and the thing is, is you build you can build that in Linux just as an executable. It's exactly the same. Just build it as an executable and then run it, and away you go. So, so, Steve, I'm going to reply to something you said. You're not sure how many people are going to use this. I, I think a lot of people are going to use this. Um, a random thought popped into my head, a random question. So, Mallory, what if individuals who come and sit for NI training can also walk away with the Pico board, um, the Raspberry Pi with the Pico board? such that when they depart from training, they've got the hardware so that they can continue to go through some of the previous examples that they learned at, um, at their instructor-led training. What are some ways of bringing this into instructor-led training from NI? No, I definitely think that's interesting. I think um, in the past year or two, we had to make the decision to um, remove the instrument control lessons because we had custom built an instrument control simulator that just the expertise to maintain it, the original writers and things had left and we had an aging uh, classroom set that was starting to fail. And so we had moved those lessons to an appendix and that's something that we're currently trying to solve for. So you can rest assured I took plenty of notes uh, as something like that. Um, and so I do think that would be something cool um, particularly when it comes to the instrumentation side. And I um, also wanted to highlight, in case you guys missed it, on the to-do list is um, the NIDAC API as well. And, and then that's really fantastic because someone can go from, you know, I'm working on this kitchen table and I go into the office and I'm gonna go run my code just like I wrote it and they're understanding exactly what they need to understand to be successful with um, NI's uh, data acquisition products. 
All right, I've figured out what my problem was. Are you showing something off now, Steve, or? No, I was just building executables in okay. Linux. Okay. Uh, so and, and time check, we got about two minutes, I think. Yeah. So I did have it already saved, and that's the problem was, is it was hidden. This code was all hidden off screen on the block diagram, and I was trying to do it a second time. Um, so now if I run this, I can steer this car. So you can, you can use this for all sorts of inputs, make custom controllers, uh, eventually want to use this for robotics. Are you using uh, a punt? Yeah, so this yeah. is a little potentiometer. Uh, and I yeah, I just want to make sure everybody <laughs> knows um, Derek is actually steering the car by turning the potentiometer that is connected here. And it's backwards. And he's crashing so. the car. Um, so yeah, so again, the idea is this is going to expand the hobbyist capabilities. Uh, so by all means, even if you're not necessarily interested in the training, um, if we add more features and capabilities to the firmware and the hardware, uh, that will then make this platform available for more training. Uh, and driving backwards is difficult. Um, but so... So Derek, what are two or three hobbyist things that are on your list of things you want to do? Uh, so I'm into robotics. I do all sorts of little ground rovers with GPS and, and uh, sonar and LIDAR uh, mapping capabilities. Uh, I want to get into mid-power rocketry and do rocket uh, altitude trackers and deployment mechanisms. Um, but if people want to make fancy light shows on their walls or have buttons that, um, for, for doing home automation or other stuff, um, it's kind of where a lot of the stuff I'm planning on using it drives towards. Um, but that's me, so let us steal your ideas. So you're the hobbyist. I'm, the, uh, I'm interested for the training perspective. And then Steve, where'd you go? Me? There uh, you are. I'm we hear your to, voice. I'm hoping to sell our hands on to a customer and make shitloads of money. Hands on. Excellent. <laughs> um, any last questions <laughs> before we close out? Or Steve, any last comments? Derek, any last comments? I'll share something real quick. So some of you might have seen uh, several years ago, I'm a big Harry Potter fan. A lot of my friends know that. I made a Weasley clock. Now in the, the Harry Potter universe, basically there's a magic clock that shows where all the members of the family are. So, and I made one for my family that's based on our phones, GPS and updates. And it's on a Raspberry Pi and it's using the Lynx toolkit. My version 2.0 I want to do actually has an IR sensor. And if you know at the Harry Potter parks, you can do spells with the wands and it's through an IR sensor. I want to do the same thing and then have it animate and do things on the clock, but also control lighting around my house and all sorts of stuff. So this sounds really fun to do using this new technology that they're talking about. So. Fantastic. I want to thank you all. Um, just so you know, I am going to drop a quick video on um, my LinkedIn. So it's Nancy Henson uh, on my LinkedIn. And then I'm going to be dropping videos that are going to be the um, complementary to the lesson. So someone can watch a, a short video, like two minutes, then they go through the lesson, and then we talk about the lesson afterwards. So that we, um, anyone who just wants to learn and have a little bit of instruction through a video, um, we're going to add, that's one of the things I'm going to be adding as well. And there we go. Anything else? Thank you, guys. I'm really hoping that this helps. Um, we, want, we want more and more LabVIEW programmers out there, and I'm really hoping that this is going to be, I think it's going to be a, a big uh, boost to the LabVIEW community and uh, facilitating adoption of LabVIEW. And so that uh, all of Darren's kids will have the tools that they need to learn LabVIEW. So thank you, guys.